on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. If everybody's caring for everybody all the time universally, you're pretty soon in the mm. maddening world we live in, right? Where people can tell you with a straight face that their actions are intended to save the planet and not experience a sense of grandiosity in saying that. Mm. Not experiencing a madness, a sense of things on a, a scale that is not proper to any human being and is bound to be destructive of their capacity to be related to what is at hand. Because as soon as you think you can operationalize that, you can turn everyone into a Samaritan and you begin to destroy the home world, right? There's the freedom to go outside, but if the freedom to go outside destroys any inside, then what have you done? Welcome to the end of tourism, conversations on wanderlust, exile, and radical hospitality. A quick reminder that the podcast lives on a gift economy model, which means that anyone, anywhere can listen, regardless of their economic situation. Your gift ensures it stays that way, free of advertisements and members only paywalls. It allows me to devote a great deal of time to this project to pay for the software and hardware that makes the podcast possible, as well as all of the production and post-production labor. In order to keep the project fed, you can subscribe by making monthly, annual, or one-time offerings at chriscristu.substack.com, where you'll also have access to my writing on these and other subjects including food culture, psychedelics, media ecology, and myth. You can also support us by leaving a review for the pod on Apple or Spotify, by sharing the episodes with your friends, and by following us on social media via the handle, The End of Tourism. On this episode, my guest is David Cayley, a Toronto-based Canadian writer and broadcaster. For more than 30 years, he made radio documentaries for CBC Radio 1's program, Ideas which premiered in 1965 under the title The Best Ideas You'll Hear Tonight. In 1968, in Chicago, he heard a lecture given by Ivan Illich, and in 1970, he and others brought Illich to Toronto for a teach-in called Crisis in Development. This was the beginning of their long relationship. Eighteen years later, Cayley invited Illich to do a series of interviews for CBC Radio's Ideas. Cayley is the author of Ideas on the Nature of Science, The Rivers North of the Future, The Testament of Ivan Illich, Puppet Uprising, The Expanding Prison, The Crisis in Crime and Punishment and the Search for Alternatives, George Grant in Conversation, Northrop Fry in Conversation, Ivan Illich in Conversation, and finally, The Age of Ecology. David Cayley has an honorary doctorate in Sacred Letters from Thornlow University. Welcome, David, to the End of Tourism podcast. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Mm, I'm very grateful to have you joining me today, and I'm curious if you could offer our listeners a little glimpse into where you find yourself today and what the world looks like for you through the lenses of um, David Cayley. Gray and wet. In Toronto, we've had a mild winter so far, although we did just have some real winter for a couple of weeks. So I'm at my desk in my house in downtown Toronto. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us, David. You know, I came to your work quite long ago, first through the book, The Rivers North of the Future, The Testament of Ivan Illich, and then through your longstanding tenure as the host of CBC Ideas in Canada. I've also just finished reading your newest book, Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey. Uh, for me, which has been a, a clear and comprehensive homage uh, to, to that man's work. And so from what I understand from the reading, you were a friend of Illich as, as well as the late Gustavo Esteva, a mutual friend of ours, who I interviewed for the podcast shortly before his death in 2021. Now, since friendship is one of the themes I'd like to approach with you today, I'm wondering if you could tell us about how you met these men and what led you to writing a biography of the former, of Ivan? Well, let me answer about Ivan first. I, I met him 
As a very young man, uh, I had spent two years living in northern Borneo, eastern Malaysia, the Malaysian state of Sarawak, as part of an organization called the Canadian University Service Overseas, which many people recognize only when it's identified with the Peace Corps. It was a similar initiative or the VSO very much of the time. And when I returned to Toronto in 1968, one of the first things I saw was an essay of Ivan's, which usually circulates under the a name he never gave it, which is To Hell With Good Intentions, hmm. a, a talk he had given in Chicago to some young volunteers in a Catholic organization bound for Mexico. And it made a sense to me in a radical and surprising way. So I would say it began there. I went to CDOC the following year. The year after that, we brought Ivan to Toronto for a teach-in in the fashion of the time. And he was then an immense celebrity. So we turned people away from a 600-seat seat theater that night when he lectured in Toronto. And I kept in touch uh, subsequently through reading mainly, and we didn't meet again until the later 1980s when he came to Toronto. Uh, he was then working on in the history of literacy. He just published a book called ABC, The Alphabetization of the Western Mind. And that's where we became more closely connected. I went later that year to State College, Pennsylvania, where he was teaching at Penn State and recorded some inter a long interview, I mean, radically long, and made a five-hour idea series. But by a happy chance, I had not thought of this. His friend, Lee Hoynatsky, asked for the raw tapes, transcribed them, and eventually that became a published book. And marked an epoch in Ivan's reception as well as in my life, because a lot of people responded to the spoken or transcribed village in a way that they didn't seem to be able to respond to his writing, mm. which was scholastically condensed, let's say. I always found it extremely congenial, and I would even say witty in the deep sense of wit. Mm. Uh, but I think a lot of people, uh, you know, found it hard, and so the spoken village People came to him, even old friends, and said, well, you know, we understand you better now. So um, the following year, he came to Toronto and stayed with us, and, you know, a friendship blossomed. And also uh, a funny relationship where I kept trying to get him to express himself more on the theme that of the book you mentioned, The River's Nose of the Future, which is his feeling that modernity in the the big sense of modernity, can be best understood as a perversion is a word that he used because he liked strong words, but it can be a frightening word. Corruption also has its difficulties, but sometimes he's had a turning inside out, which I like very much, or a turning upside down mm -hmm. of the gospel. So when the world has its way with the the life, death, and resurrection, and teaching of Jesus Christ, which inevitably becomes an institution, when the world has its way with that, the way leads to where we are. That was his radical thought, and a novel thought, according to the philosopher Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher who was kind enough to write in a preface to that book when it was published, and I think very much aided its reception because for people who knew, knew who Charles Taylor was, and by then they had kind of forgotten who mm. Ivan Illich was. Mm. To give an example of that, when he died, the, the New York Times obituary uh, was headlined, Priest Turned Philosopher Appealed to Baby Boomers in the 60s. Like, mm. this is. It's, this is yesterday's man, in other words, right? right? This is somebody who used to be important. So he just kept at him about it and eventually became clear he was never going to write that book for a whole variety of reasons, which I, I won't go into hmm. now. But he did allow me to come 
to Cuernavaca, where he was living, and to do another very long set of interviews, which produced that book, The River Starts in the Future. So that's the history in brief. The very last part of that story is that the rivers north of the future and the radio series that it was based on identifies themes that I, that I find to be quite explosive. And so in a certain way, the, the book you mentioned, Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey, was, was destined from the moment that I recorded those conversations. Mm. Yeah, thank you, David. So much of what you said right there ends up being the, the basis for most of my questions today, especially around the corruption or the perversion, what perhaps Illich also termed as, as iatrogenesis. But much of what I've also come to ask today stems and revolves around Illich's reading of the Good Samaritan story. So I'd like to start there, if that's all right. Okay. And, yeah. you know, for our listeners who aren't familiar either with the story or Illich's take on it, I'd, I've gathered some small excerpts from an intellectual journey so that they might be on the same page, so to speak. So from Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey, Jesus tells the story after he has been asked how to, quote, inherit eternal life, end quote, and has replied that one must love God and one's neighbor, quote, as oneself. But, quote, who is my neighbor, his interlocutor wants to know. Jesus answers with his tale of a man on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, who is beset by robbers, beaten, and left, quote, half dead, by the side of the road. Two men happen along, but, quote, pass by on the other side. One is a priest, and the other a Levite, a group that assisted the priests at the great temple, which, at that time, dominated the landscape of Jerusalem from the Temple Mount. Then, a Samaritan comes along. The Samaritans belonged to the estranged northern kingdom of Israel, and did not worship at the temple. Tension between the Samaritans and the Judeans in the Second Temple period gives the name a significance somewhere between foreigner and enemy. In contemporary terms, he was, as Illich liked to say, a Palestinian. The Samaritan has, quote, compassion on the wounded one. He stops, binds his wounds, takes him to an inn, where he can convalesce, and promises the innkeeper that he will return to pay the bill. And so Jesus concludes by asking, which of the three passers-by was the neighbor? Illich claimed that this parable had been persistently misunderstood as a, sto- as a story about how one ought to act. He had surveyed sermons from the 3rd through 19th centuries, he said, and found a broad consensus that what was being proposed was a, quote, rule of conduct. But this interpretation was, in fact, quote, the opposite of what Jesus wanted to point out. He had not been asked how to act toward a neighbor, but rather, who is my neighbor? And he had replied, scandalously, that it could be anyone at all. The choice of the Samaritan as the hero of the tale said, in effect, it is impossible to categorize who your neighbor might be. The sense of being called to help the other is experienced intermittently and not as an unvarying obligation. A, quote, new kind of ought has been established, Illich says, which is not related to a norm. It has a telos. It aims at somebody, some body, but not according to a rule. And finally... The master told them that who your neighbor is is not determined by your birth, by your condition, by the language which you speak, but by you. You can recognize the other man who is out of bounds culturally, who is foreign linguistically, who, you can say by providence or pure chance, is the one who lies somewhere along your road in the grass and create the supreme form of relatedness which is not given by creation but created by you. Any attempt to explain this ought as as corresponding to a norm takes out the mysterious greatness from this free act. And so 
I think there are at least, at the very least, a few major points to take away from this uh, little summary I've extracted. One, that the ability to choose one's neighbor breaks the boundaries of ethnicity at the time, which were the bases for understanding one's identity and people and place in the world. And two, that it creates a new foundation for hospitality and interculturality. And so I'm curious, David, if you'd be willing to elaborate on these points as you understand them. Well, if, if you went a little farther on in that part of the book, you'd find an exposition of a, a German teacher and, and writer, professor, close held, that I found very helpful in understanding what Ivan was saying. Held is a phenomenologist and, and a follower of Husserl. But he uses Husserl's term of the home world, right? That each of us has a home world, Hmm. which is our ethnos, within which our ethics apply. It's a a world in which we can be at home and in which we can somehow manage, right? There are a manageable number of people to whom we are obliged. Uh, We're not universally obliged. So... What was interesting about Held's analysis is that then the condition in which the wounded man lies is he's fallen outside of any reference or any home world, right? Mm. Nobody has to care for him. Right? The priest and the Levite evidently don't care for him. They have more important things to do. One, the story doesn't tell you why. Mm. Is he ritually impure as one apparently dead is... What? You don't know. But they're on their way. Uh, they have other things to do. So the Samaritan is, is radically out of line, right? He dares to enter this no man's land, this exceptional state in which the wounded man lies. And he does it on the strength of a feeling, right? A stirring inside him. A call. It's definitely a bodily experience in Ivan's language of norms. It's, it's, it's not a norm. It's not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's not a thought. He's stirred. He is moved to do what he does, and he cares for him and takes him to the inn and so on. So the, the important thing in it for me is, is to understand the complementarity that's involved. Held says that if you try and develop a set of norms and ethics, however you want to say it, what out of the Samaritans act, it, it ends up being radically corrosive, damaging, destructive, disintegrating of the home world, right? Mm. If everybody's caring for everybody all the time universally, you're pretty soon in the maddening world, not pretty soon, but in a couple of millennia, in the mm. maddening world we live in, right? Where people can tell you with a straight face that their actions are intended to save the planet. Mm. And not experience a sense of grandiosity in saying that, right? Mm. Not experiencing seemingly a madness, a sense of things on a, a scale that is not proper to any human being and is bound, I think to be destructive of their capacity to be related to what is at hand. So I think what Ivan is saying in saying this is a new kind of ought, right? It's the whole thing of the corruption of the best is the worst in a nutshell. Because as soon as you think you can operationalize that, you can turn everyone into a Samaritan, and you you begin to destroy the home world, right? You begin to destroy ethics. You begin to, dis- you, or you transform ethics into something which is a contradiction of ethics. So there isn't an answer in it, in what he says. There's a complementarity, right? Mm. There's the freedom to go outside, but if the freedom to go outside destroys any inside, then what have you done, right? Mm. You've created an unlivable world, a world of such unending, such unimaginable obligation. 
as one now lives in Toronto, you know, where I pass homeless people all the time. I can't care for all of them. So I think it's also a, a way of, of understanding for those who, who contemplate it that you really have to pay attention. What, what are you called to, right? What can you do? What is, what is within your amplitude? What is urgent for you? Do that thing, right? Do not make yourself mad with impossible charity. A charity you don't feel, you can't feel, you couldn't feel, right? Take care of what's at hand, what you can take care of, what calls mm. you. I think this comes up quite a bit these days, especially in light of international conflicts, conflicts that arise far from people's homes, and yet the demand of that ought, perhaps, of having to be aware and having to have or having to feel some kind of responsibility to these things that are happening in other places that maybe it's not that they don't have anything to do with us, but that our ability to have any kind of recourse for what happens in those places is perhaps flippant, fleeting, and even that we're stretched to the point that we can't even attend and attend to what's happening in front of us in our neighborhoods. And so I'm curious as to how this came to be. You mentioned the corruption, and maybe we could just define that if possible, for our listeners, this notion of the corruption of the best is the worst. Would you be willing to do that? Do you think that that's an easy thing I've, to do? I've been trying for <laughs> 30 years. I can keep on trying. I really, I mean, that was the seed of mm. everything. At, at the end of the interview we did in 19, Yvonne dropped that little bomb on me. Mm. And I, I was a diligent man and I had prepared very carefully I'd read everything he'd written and then at the very end of the interview he says the whole history of the West can be summed up in the phrase corruptio optimi pessima he was quite fluent in Latin the corruption of the best is the worst hmm. and I thought wait a minute the whole history of the West I mean this is staggering so yes I've been reflecting on it for a long time but I, I think there are many ways to speak about the incarnation, the idea that God is present and visible in the form of a human being, that God indeed is a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. One way is to think of it as a kind of nuclear explosion of religion. Religion had always been the placation of a God, right? A sacrifice of, of some kind. Uh, made to placate a god. Now the god is present. It could be you. Jesus is explicit about it. And I think that is the most important thing for Iman in reading the gospel, is that God appears to us as one another. Hmm. Or if you can put it one another in, in the most general sense of that formula. So that's explosive, right? I mean, religion, in a certain way, up to that moment, is society. It's the integument of every society. It's the nature of the beast to be religious in the sense of having an understanding of how you're situated and in what order and with what foundation that order exists. It's not an intellectual thing, it's just what people do. Karl Barth says religion is a yoke. So it has in a certain way exploded or been exploded at that moment, but it will, of course, be reinstituted as a religion. What else could happen? Mm. And so Ivan says, and there's probably slim New Testament warrant for this, but this was his story, that in the very earliest apostolic church, they were aware of this danger, right? Mm. That Christ must be shadowed by Antichrist, a term that Ivan was brave enough to use. The word just has a terrible, terrible history. I mean, the Protestants abused the Catholics with the name of Antichrist. Luther mm. rages against the Pope as Antichrist. Mm. And the word persists now as a kind of, either as a sign of evangelical dogmatism or maybe as a joke 
Right. When I was researching it, I came across a book called How to Tell If Your Boyfriend is the Antichrist. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, a jokey thing in a way, insofar as people know about it. He dared to use it as to say, the Antichrist is simply the instituted Christ. Right? It's not anything exotic. It's not anything theological. It's the inevitable worldly shadow of there being a Christ at all. Mm. And so that's that's the beginning of the story. He he claims that the church loses sight of this understanding, loses sight of the basic complementarity or contradiction that's involved in the incarnation in the first place, that this is something that can never be owned, something that can never be instituted, something that can only happen again and again and again within each one. So... But heaven can never finally come to earth except perhaps in a story about the end, right? Mm. The, the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. Fine, that's at the end, not mm -hmm. now. <laughs> right. So that's the gist of what he, what he said. He has a, a detailed analysis of the stages of that journey, right? So within your theme of hospitality, the beginnings of... The church becoming a social worker in the decaying Roman Empire and and beginning to develop institutions of hospitality, places for all the flotsam and jetsam of the, of the decaying empire, and then in a major way in the from the 11th through the 13th century when the the church institutes itself as a mini or proto state, right, with a new conception of law, every element of our modernity prefigured in the medieval church and what it undertook, according to Ivan. This was all news to me when he first <laughs> said it to me. Mm. So yeah, the story goes on into our own time when I think one of the primary paradoxes or confusions that we face is that most of the people one meets and deals with believe themselves to be living after Christianity and indeed to great opponents of Christianity. I mean, nothing is more important uh, in Canada now than to denounce residential schools, let's say, right? Which were the schools for indigenous uh, children, the boarding schools, which were mainly staffed by the church, right? So the Gothic figure of the nun, the sort of vulpine, sinister, that's the image of the church, right? So you have so many reasons to believe that you're after that. You've woken up, you're woke. And and you see that now, right? So you don't in any way see yourself as involved in this inversion of the gospel which has actually created your world and which is still in so many ways you. So leftists today, if I'm using the term leftists very, very broadly, progressives, people sometimes say woke. People's. These are all, in a certain way, super-Christians or mm -hmm. hyper-Christians, but absolutely unaware of themselves as Christians. And any day you can read an analysis which traces everything back to the Enlightenment, right? Mm -hmm. We need to reinstitute the Enlightenment. We've forgotten the Enlightenment. We have to get back to the Enlightenment, right? There's nothing before the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is the over, is that's an earlier overcoming of Christianity, right? Mm. So modernity is constantly overcoming Christianity and constantly forgetting that it's Christian. Mm. That these are the ways in which the incarnation is working itself out. And one daren't say that it's bound to work itself out that way. One will go as far as to say it's seemingly the will of God that it should work itself out that way. Right? Wow. So that the gospel will be preached to all nations as predicted at the end of the gospels. Go therefore and preach to all nations. But it will not be preached in its explicit form. Mm. It will enter it, as it were, through the back door. So that's a very big thought. But it's a saving thought in certain ways because it does suggest a way of unwinding or winding mm -hmm. up the string of finding out how this happened. What, what is the nature of the misunderstanding that is being played out here? So. Wow.
yeah, I mean, I, I feel like what you just said was a, a kind of nuclear bomb unto its own. I remember reading, for example, James Hillman in The Terrible Love of War, and at the very end, he essentially listed all, not all, but many of the major characteristics of modern people and said, if you act this way, you are Christian. If you act this way, you are Christian, essentially revealing that so much of modernity has these Christian roots. And, you know, you said in terms of this message and corruption of the message going in through the back door. And I think that's what happens in terms of at least when we see institutions in the modern time, schools, hospitals, roads, essentially modern institutions and lifestyles making their way into non-modern places. And I'm very fascinated in this in terms of hospitality. You said that the church, and I think you're quoting Illich there, but the church is a social worker, but also how this hospitality shows up in the early church and maybe even how they feared about what, would, what could happen as a result to this question of the Incarnation. When in your book, it was just fascinating to read this, that you said, or that you wrote, that in the early years of Christianity, it was customary in a Christian household to have an extra mattress, a bit of candle, and some dry bread in case the Lord Jesus should knock at the door in the form of a stranger without a roof, a form of behavior that was utterly foreign to the cultures of the Roman Empire in which many Christians lived. And it's, you write, you took in your own, but not someone lost on the street. And then later, when the Emperor Constantine recognized the church, Christian bishops gained the power to establish social corporations. And this is, I think, the idea of the, the social worker, the church is a social worker. And you write that the first corporations they started were Samaritan corporations, which designated certain categories of people as preferred neighbors. For example, the bishops created special houses financed by the community that were charged with taking care of people without a home. Such care was no longer the free choice of the householder. It was the task of an institution. The appearance of these xenodokea, literally, quote, houses for foreigners, signified the beginning of a change in the nature of the church. And then, of course, you write, and you mentioned this, but a, a gratuitous and truly free choice of assisting the stranger has become an ideology and an idealism. Right. And so this seems to be how the corruption of the Samaritan story, the corruption of breaking that threshold, or at least being able to cross it, comes to produce this incredible ought, as you just kind of elaborated for us. And then this notion of that, that we can't see it anymore, that it becomes this thing in the past, as you said. In other words, history, right? And so my next question uh, is a question that comes to some degree from our late mutual friend Gustavo, Gustavo Esteva. And I'd just like to preface it by uh, a small sentence from An Intellectual Journey, where you wrote that, I think that limit in Illich is always linked to nemesis, or to what Jung calls enantiodromia, his Greek word for the way in which any tendency, when pushed too far, can turn into its opposite. And so, a long time ago, Illich once asked Gustavo if he could identify a word that could describe the era after development, or perhaps after development's death. And Gustavo said, hospitality. And so, much later, in a private conversation with Gustavo, in the context of tourism and gentrification, the kind that was beginning to sweep across Oaxaca at the time, some years ago, he told me that he considered the sale of one's people's radical or local hospitality as a kind of invitation to hostility in the place and within the ethnos that one lives in. Another way of saying it might be that the subversion and absence of hospitality in a place breeds or can breed hostility. Curious what you make of his comment in the light of limits in Antiodromia and the corruption that Illich talks about. Well, I'd like to say one thing, which is the thought I was having while you, while you were speaking, because at the very beginning I mentioned... Uh, a reservation 
a discomfort with words like perversion and corruption. And the thought is that it's easy to understand Illich as doing critique, right? And, and it's easy then to moralize that critique. And I, I think it's important that he's showing something that happens, right? And that I, I daren't say bound to happen, but is likely to happen mm. because of who and what we are, that we will institutionalize, that we will make rules, that we will, right? So I think it's important to rescue Ivan from being read moralistically or, or that you're reading a scold here, right? Mm. And, right. I mean, and many social critics are or are read as scolds, right? Uh, mm. And contemporary people are so used to being scolded that they, and scold themselves very regularly. So. I I just wanted to say that to rescue mm -hmm. Ivan from a certain kind of reading. So you're you're quoting Gustavo on on the way in which the opening up of a, of a culture touristically can lead to hostility, right? Right. And I, I think also commenting on the the roots of the words are the same, right? Hostile and hospice. They're 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 drawing on the same, right? That's right. It's it's how one treats the enemy. I think mm. is 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 the hinge mm. in all those words. What's the difference between hospitality and hostility? So I think that thought is profound and profoundly fruitful. So I think Gustavo had many resources in expressing it. I couldn't possibly express it any better. I never answered you at the beginning how I met Gustavo, but the, on the, that occasion in 1988, when I was interviewing Illich, they were all gathered, a bunch of friends, to write what was called the Development Dictionary, a series of essays trying to write an epilogue to the era of development. So Gustavo, as you know, was an, a charming man who spoke of peculiarly beautiful English in which he was fluent but somehow you could hear the cadence of Spanish through it without it even being strongly accented. So I rejoiced always in interviewing Gustavo which I did several times because he was such a pleasure to listen to. But anyway, I've digressed. Maybe I'm ducking your question. Do you want to re-ask it or? Sure, or yeah, I suppose, you know, although there were a number of essays that Gustavo wrote about hospitality that I don't believe have been published, they focused quite a bit on this notion of individual people, but especially communities, putting limits on their hospitality. And of course, much of this hospitality today comes in the form of, or at least in the context of tourism, of international visitors, and that's kind of the infrastructure that's placed around it. And yet he was arguing essentially for limits on hospitality. And I think what he was seeing, although it hadn't quite come to fruition yet in Oaxaca, was that the commodification, the commercialization of one's local indigenous hospitality, once it's sold or once it's only existing for the value or money of the foreigner in a kind of customer service worldview, that it invites this deep hostility. And so do these limits show up as well in, in Illich's work in terms of the stranger, right? Because so much of the Christian tradition is based in a universal fraternity, universal brotherhood. I said that it made sense to me in my youth as a 22-year-old man. So I've lived under his influence. I, I took him as a master, let's say, and, 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 uh, as a young person. And I would say that probably it's true that I've never gone anywhere that I haven't been invited to go. So that I, I could experience that, uh, that I was called to be there. Mm. And he was quite the jet setter, so I was often called by him to come to Mexico or to, to go to Germany or whatever it was. But we live in a world that is so far away from the world that might have been, let's say, the world that mm. might be. So John Milbank, a British a theologian who's inspiring to me and a friend and somebody who I found surprisingly parallel to Illich in a lot of ways after Ivan died and died, I think, feeling that he was pretty much alone in, in 
some of his understandings. But John Milbank speaks of the of recovering the future that we've lost, which is obviously have to be based on some sort of historical reconstruction. You have to find the place to go back to where the wrong turning was mm. in a certain way. But meanwhile, we live in this world, right? Where even where you are, many people are dependent on tourism, right? And to that extent, they live from it and couldn't instantly do without. To do without it would be would be catastrophic, mm. right? So it's it's not easy to live in both worlds, right? To live with the understanding that th this is, as Gu as Gustavo says, it's bound to be a source of hostility, right? Because we can't we can't sell what is ours as an experience for others without changing its character, right? Without commodifying it, it's it's impossible to do. So it, it must be true, and yet at a certain moment, people feel that it has to be done. Right? And so you have to live in, in both realities. And mm. in a certain way, the skill of living in both realities is what's there at the beginning. Right? That if you take the f formula of the incarnation as a nuclear explosion, well, you're still going to have religion. Right? So that's inevitable. The world has changed and it hasn't changed at the same time. And that's mm -hmm. true at every moment. And so you learn to walk, right? You learn to distinguish the gospel from its surroundings. And, and a story about Ivan that, that made a big impression on me was that when he was sent to Puerto Rico when he was uh, still active as a priest in 1956 and became vice rector of the Catholic University at Ponce and, and a member of the school board, a position that he regarded as entirely political. So he said, I will not in any way operate as a priest while I'm performing a political function hmm. because I don't want these two things to get mixed up. Hmm. And he made a little exception. and He bought a little shack in a, in a remote fishing village and just for the happiness of it, he would go there and and say mass for the fishermen who didn't know anything about this other world. So, <laughs> but that was a radical conviction and, and put him at odds with many of the tendencies of his time, as for example, what came to be called liberation theology, right? That there could be a politicized theology. His view was different. His view was that the church as she, as he said, rather than it, had to be always distinguished, right? So it was the capacity to distinguish that was so crucial for him. And I would think even in situations where tourism exists and has the effect Gustavo supposed, the beginning of resistance to that and the beginning of a way out of it is always to distinguish, mm. right? to know the difference, which is a slim read. But, but faith is always a slim read. And Ivan's first book, his first collection of published essays was called Celebration of Awareness, which is in a, a way of saying that, what I call know the difference. So I'm gonna, if I can, yeah. offer you this, this next question, which comes from James, a friend in Guelph, Canada. And James is curious about the missionary mandate of Christianity emphasizing a fellowship in Christ over ethnicity and whether or not this can be reconciled with Illich's perhaps emphatic defense of local or vernacular culture. Well, yeah, he illustrates it. I mean, mm. He was a worldwide guy. Mm -hmm. He was very far from his roots, mm. which were arguably cut. He didn't deracinate himself. Mm. He was with his mother and brothers exiled from Split in Dalmatia as a boy in the crazy atmosphere of the 30s. But he was a tumbleweed after that. Mm. Uh, and so, so I think we all live in that world mm. now. And this is confuses people about him. So a historian called Todd Hart wrote a book 
still really the only book published in English on the history of Sidoc and Cornavaca, hmm. in which he says Illich is anti-missionary. And he rebukes him for that. And I would say that Ivan, on his assumptions, cannot possibly be anti-missionary. He says clearly in his early work that a Christian is a missionary or is not a Christian at all, in the sense that if one has heard the good news, one is going to share it, hmm. or one hasn't heard it. Now, what kind of sharing is that? It isn't necessarily you have to join my religion, you have to subscribe to the following ten. It isn't necessarily a catechism, it may be an action. Hmm. It may be a, it may be a, an act of a friendship, maybe an act of renunciation. It can be any number of things, but it has to be an outgoing expression of mm -hmm. what one has been given. And I think he was, in that sense, always a missionary, and in many places, seeded communities that are seeds of the new church. Right? He spent well from the time he arrived in the United States. In, 51, 52, till the time that he withdrew from church service in 68, he was constantly pr preaching and talking about a new church. And a new church, for him, involved a new relation between innovation and tradition. Hmm. New but not new. Since when he looked back, he saw the gospel was constantly undergoing translation into new milieu, into new places, into new languages, into new forms. But he encountered it in the United States as pretty much in one of its more hardened or congealed phases, right? And mm. it was the export of that particular brand of cultural and imperialistic because American, and American happened to be the hegemon of the moment, that's what he opposed the translation of that into Latin America. And people like to write each other into consistent positions, right? So he must then be anti-missionary across the board, right? But so I think you can be low and universal. I mean, the, the, one doesn't even want to recall that slogan of, you know, act locally, think globally, because it got pretty hackneyed, right? And it was abused. But it's true in a certain way that that's the only way one can be a Christian. Mm. The, the neighbor, you, you said it, I wrote it, I said it, the, the neighbor can be anyone, mm. right? But here I am here now, right? So both have to apply, both have to be true, mm. right? It's, right? It's again a complementary relation. And it's a banal thought in a certain way, but it, it seems to be the thought that I think most often, right, is that what creates a great deal of the trouble in the world is inability to think in a complementary fashion, in a, to think within, to take contradiction as constituting the world. The world mm -hmm. is constituted of contradiction and couldn't be constituted in any other way as far as we know, right? Mm can't walk without two legs, you can't manipulate without two arms, two hands. We know the structure of our brains are, are also bilateral and, and everything about our language is, is constructed on opposition. Everything is oppositional and yet when we enter the world of politics, it seems we're going to have it all one way. Mm. The church is going to be really Christian and it's going to make everybody really Christian <laughs> or communist, what have you, right? The contradiction is set aside. Philosophy defines truth as the mm. absence of contradiction, mm. basically. Mm. So be in both worlds, know the difference, mm. walk on two feet. That's Ivan. Mm. I love that. And I'm, I'm curious about, you know, one of the themes of the podcast is exile. And of course, that can mean a lot of things. In the introduction to An Intellectual Journey, you wrote that, that Illich, once he had left Split in the 30s, that he began an experience of exile that would characterize his entire life. You wrote that he had lost not just a home, but the very possibility of home. And so it's a a theme that characterizes as well the the podcast and a lot of these conversations around travel, migration, tourism, what does it mean to be at home? 
And so this notion of exile also shows up quite a bit in the Christian faith. And maybe this is me trying to escape the complementarity of the reality of things. But I tend to see exile as inherently, we'll say, damaging or consequential in a kind of negative light. And so I've been wondering about this, this exilic condition, right? It's like in the Abrahamic faiths, as you write, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all begin in exile. And eventually this pattern culminates in the crucifixion. Jesus is executed outside the gates of the city, nailed to a cross that excludes him even from his native earth. And you write that exile is in many ways the Christian condition. And so, you know, I've read that in the past, Christian monks often consider themselves to be homeless, removed from the sort of daily life of the local community in the monasteries and abbeys and yet still of a universal brotherhood. And so I'd like to ask you if you feel this exilic condition, which seems to be also a hallmark of modernity, this kind of constant uprooting, this kind of, as I would call it, cultural and spiritual homelessness of our time, if you think that is part of the corruption that Illich based his work around. Well, one can barely imagine the world in which Abram, who became Abraham, said to God, no, I'm staying in Ur. Mm. I'm not going. I'm not going. Right? Mm. I mean, if you go back to Genesis and you reread that passage, when God shows Abraham the land that he will inherit, it says already there, there were people at that time living in the land. Right? Mm. Inconvenient people, as it turns out, Palestinians. So there's a profound contradiction here, I think. And the only way I think you can escape it is to understand the gospel the way Ivan understood it, which is as something super added to existing local cultures, right? A leaven, right? Mm. But it, not everything about a local culture or a local tradition is necessarily good. Mm -hmm. And so it can be changed, right? And I would say that Illich insists that Christians are and must be missionaries. They've received something that they, it's inherent in what they've received that they pass it on. So the world will change, right? But Ivan says, this is in Rivers North of the Future, that it's his conviction that the gospel could have been preached without destroying local proportions, the sense of proportion. And he put a great weight on the, the idea of proportionality as not just a pleasing building or a pleasing face, but the very essence of, of how a culture holds together, right? That, that things are proportioned within it to one another, that the gospel could have been preached without the destruction of proportions, but evidently it wasn't because the, the Christians felt they had the truth and they were going to share it. They were going to indeed impose it for the good of the other. Mm. So I think a sense of exile and a sense of home are as necessary to one another as in Ivan's vision of a new church innovation and tradition or almost any other constitutive couplet you can think of, right? You can't expunge exile from the tradition, but you also can't allow it to overcome the possibility of home. I mean, Ivan spoke of his own fate as a peculiar fate, right? He really anticipated the destruction of the Western culture or civilization. I mean, in the sense that now, this is a lament on the political right mainly, right? The destruction mm -hmm. of Western civilization is mm -hmm. something one constantly hears about. But he, in a way, in the chaos and catastrophe of the 30s, already felt the death of old Europe. Mm -hmm. And even a, as a boy, I think, semi-consciously at least, took the roots inside himself, took them with him. And for many people like me, he opened that tradition. He opened it to me. He allowed me to re-inhabit it in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So to find intimations of home, because 
he wasn't the only one who lost his home. The, even as a man of 78, the world in which I grew up here is, is, is gone, forgotten, and to some extent scorned by younger people who are just not interested in it. Uh, and so it's through Ivan that I, I, in a way, recovered the tradition, right? And if the tradition is related to the sense of home, of belonging to something for good or ill, then that has to be carried into the future as best we can, right? I think Ivan was searching uh, for a new church. He didn't think he had found it. He didn't think he knew what it was, I don't think. He described certain attributes of it, right? But above all, he wanted to show that the church had taken many forms in the past, right? And its worldly existence did not have to be conceived on the model of a monarchy or a parish, right? Another form that he described in, in some early essays, right? We have to find the new form, right? It, it may be radically a non-theological, if I can mm. put it like that. It may not necessarily involve the buildings that we call churches, but he believed deeply in the celebrating community as the center, the root, the essence of social existence, right? The creation of home in the absence of home or the constant recreation of home, right? Mm. Since, I mean, we will likely never again live in pure communities, right? In, in yeah. I don't know, pure is a dangerous word, but you know mm. what I mean, consistent, like they're, we're all of one kind, right? Right. I mean, this is now a reactionary position, right? I mean, mm. if you're a German and you think, well, Germany should be for the Germans. I mean, it can't right. be for the Germans, seemingly. We can't put the world back together again, right? We can't go back. And that's a huge misreading village, right? That he's a man who wants to go back, right? No, he was a radically a man who wanted to rediscover the future mm. and rescue it. Also a man who once said to hell with the future because he wanted to denounce the future. That's a computer model, right? Mm. All futures that are projections from the present, he wanted to denounce in order to rediscover the future. Mm -hmm. right? But it has to be ahead of us. It's not, and it has to recover the deposit that is behind us. So both the whole relation between past and future and indeed the whole understanding of time is out of whack. Uh, I think modern consciousness is so entirely spatialized that the dimension of time is nearly absent from it. Right? The dimension of time as duration, as the integument by which past, present, and future are connected. I don't mean that people can't look at their watch and say, I've you know, I've got to go now, I've got a 12 o'clock, you know. So, I don't know if that's an answer to James. Mm -hmm. That's where we started. <laughs> I don't know, but it's food for thought and certainly a, a feast, if I may say so. David, I have two final questions for you, if that's all right, if you have yes, all right. yep. time. Okay, wonderful. So, speaking of this notion of home and, and exile and the complementarity of the two, and, you know, you wrote and, and spoke to this notion of Illich wanting to rediscover the future. Um, and he says that we've opened a horizon on which new paradigms for thought can appear, which I think speaks to what you were saying. And um, at some point, Illich compares the opening of horizons to leaving home on a pilgrimage, as you write in your book. Mm -hmm. And not the pilgrimage of the West, which leads over a traveled road to a famed sanctuary, but rather the pilgrimage of the Christian East, which does not know where the road might lead and the journey end. And so my question is, what do you make of that distinction between these types of pilgrimages and what kind of pilgrimage do you imagine might be needed in our time? Well... I, I mean, I think I am honored the old style of pilgrimage, whether it was to Canterbury or Santiago or wherever it was to. Mm -hmm. But I think Ivan's way of expressing the messianic was in the word surprise, right? 
One, one of the w things that I think he did, and which was imposed on him by his situation and by his times, was to learn to speak to people in a way that did not draw on any theological resource. So he spoke of uh, his love of surprises, right? Mm. Well, a surprise, by definition, is what you don't suspect, what you don't expect, or it couldn't be a surprise. So the the cathedral in, in Santiago de Compostela is very beautiful, I think. I've only ever seen pictures of it, but you must expect to see it at the end of your road. You mm. must hope to see it at the end of your road. Well, the surprise is going to be something else, something that isn't known. Mm. And it was one of his great gifts to me that within the structure of habit and local existence, since I'm pretty rooted where I am and my great grandfather was born within walking distance of where I am right now, he helped me to look for surprises and to accept them also, right? That you're going to show up or someone else is going to show up, right? That there's going to be someone coming and you want to look out for the one who's coming and not, but not be at all sure that you know who or what it is or which direction it's coming from. So that, that was a a, a way of life in a certain way that I think he helped others within their limitations, within their abilities, within their local situations to see the world that way, right? That was part of what he did. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And, and I can see how in our time, in a time of increasing division and despondency and neglect, fear even, resentment of the other, that how that kind of surprise and the lack of expectation, the undermining, the subversion of expectation can find a place into perhaps the mission of our times. And so my final question comes back to friendship and interculturality. And I have one final quote here from an intellectual journey, which I highly recommend everyone okay. know, because it's just... <laughs> fascinating and blows open <laughs> so many doors we need, to, we need to sell a few more books because i want that book in paperback mm. because i want it to be able to live on in a cheaper edition so yes mm, of course thank you yeah please please pick it up right. it's worth so, with every penny on. so in an intellectual journey it is written by illich that when i submit my heart my mind my body I come to be below the other. When I listen unconditionally, respectfully, courageously, with the readiness to take in the other as a radical surprise, I do something else. I bow, bend over toward the total otherness of someone. But I renounce searching for bridges between the other and me, recognizing that a gulf separates us. Leaning into this chasm makes me aware of the depth of my loneliness and able to bear it in the light of the substantial likeness between the other and myself. All that reaches me is the other in his word, which I accept on faith. And so, David, at another point in the biography, you quote Illich describing faith as foolish. Now, assuming that faith elicits a degree of danger or betrayal, or that it could elicit that through yeah. a kind of total trust. Is that nonetheless necessary to accept the stranger or other as they are, or at least meet the stranger or other as they are? I would think so, yeah. I mean, the passage you've quoted, I think to understand it, it's one of the most profound of his sayings to me and one I constantly revert to, but to accept the other in his word or on his word or her word is I think you need to know that he takes the image of the word as the name of the Lord very very seriously and his primary way of referring to the Christ is as the word sometimes explicitly sometimes not explicitly you have to interpret um, when he says that he renounces looking for bridges, I think he's mainly referring to ideological intermediations, right? Ways in which I 
in understanding you exceed my capacity. I try to change my name for you or my category for you changes you, right? It doesn't allow your word. And what, I mean, he wasn't a man who suffered fools gladly. He had a high regard for himself and he used his time in a fairly disciplined way, right? He wasn't waiting around for others in their world. <laughs> so by word, what does he mean? What is the other's word, right? Mm. It's something more fundamental than the chatter of, of a person. So I think what that means is that we can be linked to one another by Christ. So that's the third, right? That, that yes, we're alone, right? We haven't the capacity to reach each other except via Christ. And that's made explicit for him in the opening of Elred of Riveau's treatise on friendship, which was peculiarly important to him. Elred was an abbot at a Cistercian monastery in present-day Yorkshire, which is a ruin now. Hmm. But he wrote a treatise on friendship in the 12th century. And he begins by addressing his brother monk, Ivo, and says, you know, here we are, you and I, and I hope a third. Hmm. It's Christ. So Christ is always the third, right? So in that image of the gulf, the distance, experiencing myself in my loneliness, and yet renouncing any bridge, there is still a word, the word, capital W, in which a word, your word, my word, participates or might participate. So we are building, according to him, the body of Christ, but we have to renounce our designs on one another, let's say, in order to do that. So, I mean, that's a very radical mm -hmm. saying, the, the other in his word. And in another place in the rivers north of the future, he says how hard that is after a, a century of Marxism or Freudianism, he mentions. But either way, he's speaking about my pretension to know you better than you know yourself, which almost any agency in our world that identifies needs implicitly does. I know what's best for you. So, yeah, his waiting, his ability to wait for the other one is, is absolutely, mm. and it's how a new world comes into existence. And it comes into existence at every moment, not as some unimaginable future when we all wait at the same time. Right? Like my friend used to say that peace would come when everybody got a good night's sleep on the same night. It's not very likely, is it? Right, right, right. So anyway, there we are. Hmm. Wow. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to listening to this interview again because I feel like just like uh, an intellectual journey, just like your most recent book, my mind has been perhaps exploded. Another nuclear bomb dropped. Chris, yeah. nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, I'll make sure that uh, that book and, of course, links to yours are available on the end of... All right, thank you. Yeah, deep bow, okay. David. Thank you for your time today. All the today. best, and uh, thank you for those questions. Yeah. That was, that was very interesting. You know, I spent my life as an interviewer, a good part of my life, and interviewing's very hard work. It's much harder than talking. Listening is harder than talking and rarer. <laughs> mm. So it's quite a pleasure for me late in life to be able to just let her rip and let somebody else worry about, is this going in the right direction? So thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pod. If what you heard had its way with you, if it left you with more questions than answers, then click subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or directly at chriscristu.substack.com. You can also follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. I'd like to especially thank Alexi Galar for his assistance in the post-production process of this episode and many others in this season of The Pod. You can check out his sound design and original music work at alexegalar.com. If you'd like to support the pod in other ways, we'd love assistance in the form of post-production editing and promotion or anything else you feel called to offer. Until next time.
Farewell, friends.